You know, I did start, as you said, on, on physical science and purely physical science. And in fact, I did most of my career at NASA. And we worked on developing models of climate change, evaluating those against satellite data primarily from NASA spacecraft, and really trying to figure out this whole problem of climate change. What's going on? What's causing it? What will the impacts be? Mm -hmm. But one of the things that happened was as it became more and more a, a national political issue was I would be called, as you mentioned, things like testifying in Congress or talking to the media. And you found that there was, there was a, a limit to how far you could get with just telling people scientific information. You know, our measurements would get us better and better confirmation that we understood the basic processes of climate change. Here was what was happening. These, were, these are what the impacts would be. And still, people wouldn't do anything about it. So this was one of the problems that I really saw was somehow what we were telling people wasn't really reaching them. And, and that's how my, my research evolved to looking kind of beyond just the physical science and really trying to expand to look at particular things that people re relate to more, things like public health impacts that really resonate with people, things like what it does to our ability to grow food, mm -hmm. um, things like quantifying the economic losses. And this is one of the things that I find particularly compelling is, you know, a lot of the argument is we agree Climate change is happening, but it's so expensive to deal with it, we can't afford it. But it's actually really powerful to tell people, you know, that there's a big cost by not doing something. And we've done a lot of work on that, and we can quantify that, and we can see what it does to the economy. And this is not a trade-off between, you know, fossil using fossil fuels or abandoning fossil fuels and all living in the dark, etc. Right? We're all trying to get a needed services that people want, mobility, food, energy, but we're trying to get them in a way that preserves lots of other things we want too. And so we really have to bring in this idea of a systems perspective. How do we provide all of the systems that we want while minimizing the environmental footprint? And, and I think that that's, that's much more powerful to tell people that kind of story rather than just saying, you need to minimize the environmental footprint and go, f go figure out something. Don't use fossil fuels anymore. Nobody wants to hear that. Change your behavior, right? You wanna hear, if you behave in one way, you'll get this kind of thing. And if you behave in a different way, you know, you might get this and this might be much more appealing, right? And if you're a state legislature, yes, this might cause some pain in the coal sector to change. And it might really benefit, say, the construction industry who are working outside and they're really suffering by the heat extremes. And so you're, you're really going to please many of your constituents by taking action. And maybe you can use that to kind of win over those who are, who are going to be losers, right? There are always winners and losers in these kind of transitions. Well, so the science has become incredibly clear, I would say. And one of the things that we saw last year was a whole series of reports telling us that we understand what's going on very well and the time to change is now to avoid consequences. The UN IPCC report, the American National Climate Assessment, all of these things were saying climate change is already upon us. It's already costing us. It's only getting worse and we have to veer off our current course really sharply. So something like the Green New Deal is 100% decarbonization of electricity by 2030. That's actually kind of consistent with what the science is telling us is the pace. It's an extremely rapid change. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think, really what justifiably makes some people quite anxious. We've never changed anything quite so pervasive and large scale in our nation so, so quickly. Mm -hmm. Right, we did change a lot of things. We've gone from you know uh, landlines to cell phones. We've gone from horse and buggies to motor vehicles, but these were slow, gradual transitions. And now we're talking about this massive change within a decade. So I think we're, for communication, we have to really put into into context to people that that climate change is not some distant problem that's spread out and amorphous across the whole planet. This isn't just about the polar bears in their grandchildren's lifetime, right? It's not about biodiversity in some country that they probably couldn't find on a map, right? It, this is about 
damages that are already happening. Hurricanes come in and they're much more intense and, and they're much wetter and we get huge amounts of flooding. Right? This is already happening. The West keeps catching on fire in these terrible wildfire seasons. These things are upon us and changing, this big change of decarbonization will really limit the damage from these and at the same time we can quantify what it will do to other industries like I mentioned. Construction is a great example. Mm -hmm. right? Construction yes. is outside. It's not efficient to work outside when it's yeah. over, you know, you have the, the human body physiologically can only adjust to a certain level of heat and as it gets hotter and hotter productivity just drops and so there are economic advantages. Our health spec sector spending, uh, medical insurance drops because people are healthier with mm -hmm. cooler temperatures and reduced air pollution, like you said, right? With cleaner vehicles and cleaner energy leads to better health. So we have better health at the same time that we make this transition. It's not just climate, better health. It's, it's cleaner water and cleaner air. It's our crops grow better. It's, mm -hmm. you know, all of these things, our industry, everything that's outside, trucking and transportation and construction and manufacturing is typically not in air conditioned facilities. All of these heat sensitive jobs, the performance is better. So there's huge parts of society. In fact, the bulk of society comes out ahead, I would say. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, what we really have to get across to people. It's a really difficult, challenging transition, but there's a, a, so much to gain if we can make this. And the challenge is human nature in many ways. And we, mm -hmm. we can do economic analyses and we can show that in a lot of cases, the kind of transition we're talking about saves people money. It's economically in their own best interest. Things like buying a more fuel efficient car. It seems more expensive initially and over the life of the car, you know, you more than make your, your money back because you pay less for fuel costs. Mm -hmm. And yet people still balk at this initial extra expense. And this is part of human nature to you know, not save enough for retirement because it's so far away. And we just have a difficulty planning for things that take place at a distance. And we're much more near-term focused people. And, right. and so there's, there's a barrier to overcome. You know, we, we worked in, in Asia with, um, with improving traditional brick kilns. Just an example because they, they put out a lot of, of very dirty pollution which is both public health hazard and contributes to climate change. And we told people that you know you can make these much more efficient now. We have much better technology and, and then it saves you money because the more efficient means you have to buy less fuel. Mm -hmm. And people still didn't want to change. And you know, how do you get people to change? And then there was a big earthquake in Nepal which essentially knocked down every kiln and then people are willing to build the new ones and now that everybody loves them and they say why didn't we do this before <laughs> you know but how do you get people to do it in the first place you know, we couldn't we really tried and tried and tried to convince people they were better and i think eight or so in the country managed to be changed and then you know after they're all knocked down and you have this opportunity hundreds and it really works out better but that's that's really i think one of the key challenges how do you get people to act before there's some disaster, to really look into the future and say, this is not where we want to head, even though in the short term, it's simpler to just keep going about things the way we could, are, right? It's simpler yes. to keep driving our SUVs, e even though they're, they're emitting lots of carbon. It's simpler to have a lot of plane trips to keep powering our industry from fossil fuels. We do have a lot of evidence from psychological studies that, that people do have trouble with things that occur remotely in space or time. And so one way is to put into place policies that really bring mm -hmm. the impact of those into the near term. And so you know, economically, that could be things like putting a price on the externalities. And if there's a price that represents the long-term consequences, then suddenly you see this up front and you, you, you still think that people are typically making decisions economically uh, based ones, logically based on how much they're spending versus how much they gain, mm -hmm. then that immediately shifts everybody's perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that's been tried in Europe. It's now part of California's um, policies, right? There is a price on emissions that affect climate change. Some places have gone further, and, and I have been extremely impressed by 
policies that value, this goes to actually what you work on, things like both the climate and air pollution effect, save for motor vehicles. So one of the best examples I saw was that in, in Israel, the price of a motor vehicle, the tax is almost 100%. It's huge. Right? So they have a lot of room to play with this. And they put together a scheme where the price of every motor vehicle is based on how much carbon it emits and CO2, plus how much it emits of all the pollutants. And you get a grade, they call it the green grade, which then makes it much more expensive to get a polluting car versus a, a very clean car can be almost the, the you know, something like 8%, I think, is the tax rate for the low end up to more than 100% for the high end. Huge difference. And this, this kind of policy that makes you feel the consequence the moment you buy the car yes. was so e effective that they had to you know, recalibrate the grading system after the first two years because nobody was buying them, <laughs> the dirty cars anymore. Yeah. They just priced them out of the market. But that's a really clever thing to do, I think, is to, is to make, the, make the consumer really see the long-term consequences of their purchase at the time of the purchase. Chile is another country that's done the same thing. The taxes are based on pollution. They're based for a power plant. They're based on how close, or industry, how close you are to a city. So how much people are likely to breathe the stuff you're putting out. And there's a different price based on having the exact same power plant in a, in a remote area versus near, near a town. And, and again, there are prices on motor vehicles based on how much pollution they emit. And these things have already really had an effect. So I, I, yeah, I guess that's kind of the conservative economic point of view is you, you allow the market to choose, mm -hmm. but you really send people a signal. And you do that by really pricing the externalities so that these remote effects are felt right, at, right immediately at the time of purchase. This is, is politically extremely challenging. And this is even you know, what's been happening recently with, with fossil fuels. And the idea of, of Trump was we're going to save coal jobs as if somehow environmental policy has been driving away coal jobs. But that seemed to resonate with a lot of people. And so the idea of the Green New Deal is we're going to be 100% renewable. Well, mm -hmm. what happens to all of the people that used to work in the fossil fuel industry? I think it really is important that we make sure that, that you know, minimize the suffering of those people and train them. I mean, you know, new, new sources of clean power pro provide more jobs than are lost because yes. fossil fuel extraction is very automated. Mm -hmm. Things like coal mines, you know, they lost all the jobs because machines do most of the work and you don't need so many people. So it's actually better for people, but you still need training. And so I think it's really important that we, we make sure that policies are not regressive. You know, taxes on, on gasoline, that's a larger share of the income of poor people. So we have mm -hmm. to make sure that they can still afford to get from place to place. Or there should be, you know, public transit at the same time that we yes. raise gases. We should, gas taxes, we should improve public transit. So people that can't afford to drive everywhere, you know, maybe that should be more of a luxury. Mm -hmm. Or we could encourage electric cars. And, and right now, you know, we have, we've just put in North Carolina new taxes on electric cars to try to make up for the lost income from the gas tax. And that seems very wrong headed to me. I mean, it should be yeah. the other way around. But we do have experience doing these kind of things. I mean, again, from North Carolina, one of the things that happened there was it used to be a, a state with loads and loads of tobacco farmers. Mm -hmm. And the federal government really, really subsidized farmers to switch to crops that didn't have such public health burdens, that didn't cause so many people to die from the cigarettes that were of it, that mm -hmm. the tobacco was eventually turned into. And, and it really did ease that transition. So it was not, it's still difficult for some people, but it was not as painful as, as it could be. And so I think that's the way to go. This is not just a tax independent of everything else. This is a way to encourage behavior in a certain direction, but all of the money that comes in is itself a good source of revenue to, to return to people who might be adversely affected by these policies. I am not really optimistic we will do what it takes mm -hmm. around the world. Uh, at some places, you know, California, New York State are, are, are on tr track to get the more than half their power, uh, their electricity from renewables due to, due to 
portfolio standards. But this needs to happen around the world uh, to follow the kind of scenarios we outlined in the IPCC report. So I'm not that optimistic these things will happen. What I am optimistic about is that we will make this transition probably too slowly, but it'll still be much better than not making this transition. And especially when places, the leaders like California and New York and, and, and Germany and you know, different places around the world, when they really push to have more renewable technology, the price continues to fall. And, and eventually, the price is already now for new construction cheaper for renewables mm -hmm. than for any other source of power. And so as, as things like battery prices continue to fall and we're able to manufacture batteries that are not rare earth metal dependent and such, we are able to really rely 100% on renewables, even despite their intermittency. Right? And then I, do, I don't see any economic reason anybody would continue to use fossil fuels for, say, electricity, for power generation. It just doesn't make economic sense anymore. And so. The transition, I think, will take place. I think we will move in the right direction. I think we, the, the problem still is, is it's not appreciated enough in many parts of the world how much of an advantage there is to speeding up this transition. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are places that are still want to build coal-fired power plants. Not in the United States anymore. Nobody's talking about doing that. Mm -hmm. And you know, even if, even if you ignore the the vast toll that the public health burden from all the pollution that comes out of coal-fired power plants takes, you shouldn't do this because it's just so so much more expensive. But you have companies that have been building coal plants for ages, and they come into places like Pakistan or India or Indonesia and say, we can build you this great coal-fired power plant and we've got good connections with the government and we can line, line up funding from our home country and it gets done. And it's such a bad decision and people just, uh, that, that part still really bothers me that, we, that anybody would be thinking of doing something like building coal-fired power plants today. It just should be completely off the table everywhere around the world. I think that should be our strategy, and that's what the West should be pushing for, you know, subsidizing funding. And, I, and some of the big agencies, like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, they are no longer supporting things like coal. But it's, it's what you've said, it's, it's places that used to have a big coal industry and coal-fired power plant construction mm -hmm. industry, those countries that are no longer building them at home are exporting their their uh, industrial capacity elsewhere. Yeah. And it's still this this power of the vested interest that has a lot of connections, they have financing, they can go in and, and convince these countries to do that. And mm -hmm. that, you're right, I, I think governments should be trying to stop those companies to do that. And again, that goes back to the kind of thing that you feel at home, that's gonna cause pain to these industries. So really the governments need to be getting those industries which have great technical capacity, they've got great yes. managerial skills, they've got financial skills, they can do big projects. They should be helping to put in this huge renewable transition. That's an enormous project. Yes. And they're the ideal ones to do it, right? They're the, they're the most skilled companies around the world at managing these giant power sector projects. Yeah. So I think we need to really somehow get the message across which requires governments to really be st stiff and stand up to, to these industries and say, this is the old technology, it is going away, and we want you to not f go away with it, but to be part of the solution. And so you need to transition now to being renewable power if you want to stay around as a company. I think mostly I have been fortunate in, in having some good connections that appeared when I was asked to work on things like both the IPCC assessments and some other work that the UN Environment Program set up. And UN Environment is, is not considered you know, like where you would go for, for the best information for, say, the United States, because we do loads of our own research. Mm -hmm. But in lots of developing countries that don't have these capabilities, they really looked to, to UN agencies to provide them technical information. And so these connections through UN environment, we did assessments of, of policies that would help to clean up the air while also mitigating climate change. 
And a lot of developing country people came up and said, this is really hopeful and we've really wanted to be part of the climate change story. But you know what we're really concerned about is our air quality. It's terrible in, in a lot of places. You know, Nigeria, for example, right? Lagos has terrible air quality. And so they felt really this, this is a great way for us to be part of the story of cleaning up the environment, reducing, minimizing climate change. But at the same time, we can do it via something that's really important in our country which is clean air. And so they kind of set up this, this relationship of, you know, if you can provide something that's really actionable, mm -hmm. then we don't want to know basic science. We don't want to know in general, you know, what kind of pollution do we have to, uh, have to reduce. We want to know, can you look at a particular policy? And if you can tell us that this is a really polluting sector and there are cost-effective ways to, to clean it up, and you can tell us kind of what the benefits will be in our country, then I can go back to my minister or my president or whoever, and we can really try to put this into place. And so I was just really lucky to be in the right place and be put into contact with people who really wanted to take action, mm -hmm. but didn't really have necessarily the technical capacity to determine what action to take. They don't even have emission inventories in many countries, so they have no idea where their pollution comes from or where their, their greenhouse gases come from. Um, so we worked with uh, groups in Europe and the United States and Japan and, and China and lots of different places to put together kind of these international teams that had emission estimates for different regions that could look at the impact of different policies. Uh, YASA in Austria is this International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, very similar yes. in name, and they had done a lot of work assembling databases of policies that had been put into place somewhere. So we could look at that kind of, of, of library of what emissions controls could achieve and combine that with things like fuel switching and different choices and really quantify what, what was likely to happen based on the experience of primarily Western Europe, US, and Japan who'd already put into place a lot of, a lot of these air quality measures. So we could show people in, in developing countries what they stand to gain. And, and I think that really is, in most cases, I would say a very powerful argument. You still have cases like Russia has huge amounts of methane pour out of their natural gas system and their oil uh, exploration systems and you, you go and you show them very clearly how much money they would save and how if they captured the methane and didn't didn't release it all apparently they flare off about as much methane every year as the entire United States uses <laughs> and they just flare this off and you tell them you know you know you could capture this you could use it look how much money you'd make and they'd say oh we're making more money than that through other things we don't care and so occasionally you get people that just they have absolutely no interest, mm -hmm. but I would say most places around the world, policymakers at state level, provincial, national level, are really keen to be told that there's something that they can do that will really have a tangible impact mm -hmm. in the near term, and it will also contribute to this long-term problem, which they want to do something about, but is typically not anybody's highest priority. If they're the Ministry of Transportation, or power or health, you know, their highest priority are those things. And climate is, is at the back of their list, but it's not their, not their top thing. I think I mean, one, of, one of the things that I think we don't always do that, that I think we, we can be more successful uh, with having an impact is really talking to the policymakers about what specific kind of knowledge they want. And all of the knowledge that we generate is valuable, but sometimes they, you know, they're busy people and they have limited budgets and they don't have the time or even expertise to understand the kind of articles we would publish in the technical journals. And they want to know kind of the trade-offs involved in different choices that they're making. And so the more we can figure out what kind of questions that they're really wrestling with, uh, and what kind of support they need. You know, one of the one of the papers we wrote in 2017 
came out from a discussion with policymakers. We had a round table and they wanted to push for a change in the way we report emissions to the UN Framework Convention. Mm -hmm. But they said they didn't have a paper that would really, that they could show and say, look how valuable the scientific community says this would be. So we ended up working with them to write a paper about this and trying to really quantify what would be gained by reporting in a different way. It published that paper and then they used that to get countries on board with changing the way they do this. So sometimes really just talking to them and figuring out what kind of things they need to support the actions that they want to make. I mean, they're going to make decisions about transportation policy and energy policy and such. And so the, the closer you can get to providing something that can feed into that rather than something more general, I think the more likely you can, you can affect what they're doing. I would encourage students to really expand what they're interested in and not focus either purely on physical science or purely on social science, but to realize that there, there's a play back and forth between these and decisions that, like we were just talking about that policymakers make are never going to be based solely on social science or physical science. Both are going to go in there. Mm -hmm. And so the more we understand that people are considering the economics involved in their decisions. They're considering anything that it does to public health, people care a lot about. And so being, understanding how the medical community gets their results, I think is important for climate science, even though it's not necessarily d directly related to climate science. I think understanding psychology of how people make decisions mm -hmm. and what we talked about before, how people value risk and how people value uh, damages and costs over different time scales. I think all of these things are really important. So I, I think it's, it's, it's good to have a deep grounding in some area that you're, that you're most interested, maybe social science, maybe physical science, but I would really encourage students to, to think broadly and look at these other areas too because everything is going to be connected.